Uh, my name is Tony Burke. I am Assistant General Secretary of Unite, but I'm also President of the Confederation of Shipbuilding and Engineering Unions and Chair of the Campaign for Trade Union Freedom. We've got three uh, excellent speakers tonight to discuss this whole issue of shorter working time and redistribution of, of uh, wealth. And um, the first speaker tonight is Anna Coote of the New Economics Foundation. Now, I think many of you know Anna. She's been a, a great campaigner over many years and is principal fellow of the New Economics Foundation, a leading analyst and writer and advocate in the field of social policy. And she's written widely on social uh, justice. And some of her books recently have included um, The Case for a Four-Day Week, uh, The Case for Universal Basic Services, Universal Basic uh, Services Theory and Practice, Universal Basic Income, uh, A Union Perspective, and Building a New Social uh, Commons. And there's many, many more. And we're very interested to hear what Anna has got to say on this question of working time, uh, and, uh, and in particular, her, her knowledge of the issue through the book that she's written. Anna, you're most welcome. Thank you very much, Tony. Good evening, everyone. Well, the uh, New Economics Foundation has argued for more than a decade now that we should be moving to a shorter working week. There's a growing body of evidence that it's good for human well-being, for the economy and for the environment. Well, we've often been told that it can't be done, but actually we find ourselves in a very different place today. Since March, Going out to work for five full days a week has become the exception rather than the rule for an awful lot of us. The number of workers who know what it feels like to have more free time has risen dramatically. And so is the number of employers with experience in organizing staff time differently. And as we know, there are huge numbers who are not working at all, who badly need jobs. There's a massive economic downturn with rates of unemployment that we haven't known since the 80s. No one thinks the economy will simply bounce back next year and will return to business as usual. We're looking at a deep shift, not only in how the economy works, but also in how people think the economy should work. Everybody wants to build back better. So the shorter working week is an idea whose time has come. In the first place, it's a way of sharing out a reduced supply of jobs among more people and cutting the numbers of unemployed. But it isn't just a quick fix. It certainly will help with the immediate post-pandemic recovery, but it's a strategy for the long term too. It's a foundation stone, if you like, for a, a long term transition to a fairer and more sustainable economy. And because of that, it's part of a, of a broader policy agenda, which includes raising hourly wages. And this is a crucial point. Proposals for shorter working hours must go hand in hand with measures to combat low pay so that no one is forced to work shorter hours, sorry, to work longer hours to make ends meet. Keeping more people in paid employment is obviously very important, but there's much more to it than that. As long as everyone is guaranteed sufficient rates of pay, there can be huge gains for physical and mental health. Shorter working hours can reduce stress and anxiety. It helps people get a better balance of, between paid employment and unpaid domestic work. It can leave men more time to care for their families. It, opens up opportunities for women to re-engage with the labour market on a more equal footing with men. Now for this to work well, we want hours to be as flexible as possible to suit different workers' needs. Some may want five short days rather than a three-day weekend, for example. Others may want more time off when their kids are young or time to travel or train for a new job. Most of the field studies that of working shorter working hours in practice show that what people care about is having control over their time just as much as they care about having more free time outside the workplace. <coughs> and 
we've just about to publish this book called The Case for a, a Four-Day Week. Um, and I think there'll be details about that um, posted on the, the chat line. Um, it's, we call it a four-day week because we needed to convey the idea as simply as possible. But our goal isn't a mandatory four-day week for everyone. What we're after is a steady move towards shorter hours for everyone with different arrangements negotiated to suit different needs. So I've talked so far about benefits to human well-being. There's also a strong environmental case for shorter working hours. Cross-national comparisons show that countries with lower average hours of work have a smaller ecological footprint. So you might wonder how that works. It's partly because the amount of time we have influences our everyday habits. When we have more disposable time, when we're less busy, we don't need to buy a lot of convenience goods like processed ready meals. And we don't need to take um, faster modes of transport, a car instead of a bike or a, um, a plane instead of a train. So we cut down on energy intensive consumption. And the second thing is that reduced working time can help to keep higher end earnings within reasonable limits. That's important because higher income groups generate a disproportionate share of GHG emissions. So shorter working hours chips away at the idea that work is the only rewarded by money. And the only thing we can all aspire to is to work more, to earn more, to buy more, which is unsustainable. So the move to shorter working time begins to shift the dial to influence ideas about what matters in life, and what success means. And as long as we all have enough money to live well, we can value time as a reward for our work as well. So now to the economy. A common complaint is that shorter working hours will be bad for the economy because it would lead to lower rates of productivity. Well, actually, it's been found that workers on shorter hours often increase their productivity. They do better in six hour days than eight hour days, for example because they feel better, they enjoy their work more, they're more loyal and committed to the workforce. But let's not forget that in many jobs, output per capita per hour is not a useful metric. What counts is the quality and the outcome of the work. Caring and teaching are obvious examples. And jobs in transport, I mean, it's not driving the bus faster that counts, but driving it safely and on time. And most jobs in arts and sports sectors have to be judged in terms of quality of, of output, not quantity. At the New Economics Foundation, we've always argued that the success of an economy must be measured in terms of human and planetary well-being. Reduced working time is good for the economy because it contributes to a healthy society and a sustainable future. And it can improve the quality of work in many sectors too. As we explain in the book, this is a vision we can start to realize now. We can learn from history and from plenty of practical examples around the world today. Let's not forget that today's normal was yesterday's dangerous fantasy. A 60 hour week was perfectly standard um, until trade unions started fighting for a 40 hour week more than a century ago. And more recently, over the past 20 years, there have been popular experiments with short hours working in countries like Sweden, Germany, the United States, and New Zealand. And these have all proved very successful. Governments have passed laws to support reduced working time in France, in the Netherlands, in Belgium. It's become increasingly common now for trade unions to take up the cause. The largest union in Germany, the IGM, negotiated a 28 hour week with a major employer in 2018. We've set out in the book what we call a, a roadmap for transition. Now I would urge you to read it because all I can do now is summarize it and the details really matter, but I'll do the best I can. So we recognize that tr the transition starts gradually and unevenly with a combination of voluntary and negotiated and statutory moves. And the key to making it progressive is to have a clear set of values and goals. The end goal has to be universal. 
to benefit the whole population, to reduce inequalities, and to make sure everyone is entitled to sufficient pay. It's not a standalone agenda. Cutting hours can only work towards achieving those goals if it's part of a progressive agenda to address important structural issues like industrial strategy, welfare reform, and climate mitigation. So the next step is to recognize and support existing innovations by unions, employers, and individuals. For a start, strengthen the capacity of trade unions to negotiate for shorter hours and better pay. People should have a right to join a union and to organize, and we can learn from Germany about the value of social partnerships between employers and unions and, um, and the state, which have played a really major role in cutting hours and protecting pay in that country. Next, we need government measures to support individual claims. For example, learning from the Netherlands where people have a right to ask for reduced working time and not to have their request unreasonably refused. Another way of supporting individuals is to offset reductions in pay. Belgium and the Netherlands, for example, have interesting time accounting schemes where you can bank up time to be released later on when you need it. Employers are innovators too, and they can be encouraged by adjusting tax regimes, by supporting training and development. Local authorities can be supported to lead by example, both through their direct employment practices and through their commissioning and contracting. We propose introducing a formal accreditation scheme like investors in people as a way of recognizing achievement on this front. The next thing we propose is to build on existing entitlements to introduce more free time into working life. So gradually building up the experience. For example, paid time off to care for elderly and disabled relatives, extended parental leave, additional public holidays, tapered retirement schemes with protected pension rights. This way we steadily build up experience of shorter working hours, shifting ideas about what's normal and what's desirable. There's an important role for campaigning here, of course, to celebrate the achievements that have been made so far, spread the knowledge about the effects of change and uh, tell people about the evidence as it emerges. The last stage of the roadmap is to embed change and build momentum. And here we've got five proposals. I'll just mention them briefly. We suggest setting up a standing working time commission to oversee innovation and research to analyze data and make recommendations for further changes. And the low pay commission is a model we can follow here. We want to build up the living wage so that it becomes suitable for shorter hours. The commission would lead on this. We think employ employers should be obliged to measure and publish data on the time worked within their organizations. There should be established limits for minimum and maximum hours of work. And finally, we want to make shorter working time an integral part of other progressive programs such as community wealth building, universal basic services, and the Green New Deal. So that's how we think we can move to shorter and more flexible hours of work with protected pay. This must be at the heart of recovery as we emerge from this COVID nightmare, a four day week, or its equivalent in hours spread across the week, the month, maybe the year, the lifetime as a universal entitlement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. That was very, very interesting. And a number of key issues there. And I think that um, when the book does become available, uh, certainly uh, it's going to be something in the trade union movement that we need to be circulating. The CSEU, who are one of the co-sponsors of this meeting, of course, have done uh, some initial work on this with the National e the New Economic Foundation and with others. And I think that these things will begin to tie tie together. And having said that, I want to introduce my colleague, General Secretary of the CSEU, um, Ian Waddle. Now, Ian has been the GS of the CSEU, the Confederation of Shipbuilding and Engineering Unions, since 2017. And he's also uh, was also a, a national officer of my union, Unite, in the aerospace uh, sector. 
and is director of what is called the Alex Ferry Foundation. And I'm sure Ian will touch on that, uh, that structure and how the CSEU came about uh, to begin to relaunch the campaign for shorter uh, working hours. And there's a tremendous amount of work being done against the background of COVID. It's very difficult to do the things that we wanted to do. But nonetheless, I think that this sort of meeting with the Institute of Employment Rights and others, uh, 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 NEF and um, CTUF, are going to actually set a good um, scene for this debate that's got to take place. So I'm going to introduce uh, my colleague Ian Waddle, the General Secretary of CSEU, to take you through what the CSEU's view is on working time and how we intend to go about winning a shorter working week, our uh, working time. Thank you, Tony. Um, and thanks, thanks Tony. I, I found that um, really interesting. And um, I think the good thing about it is, I, whilst I agreed with a lot of what you said, there are so also some points where I quite strongly disagree, uh, which is good for this sort of event, because otherwise you end up having a heated agreement, uh, as I call it, and everyone says the same thing. And we all, we all shake hands and virtually and say, well, that was a job well done. We all agreed with each other. And I think this is an important issue, um, and there will be different points of view. Um, and I think it's important that we build those into the debate. So as Tony said, I'm General Secretary of the CSEU, uh, the Confederation of Shipbuilding and Engineering Unions, uh, which has a, a long uh, and illustrious history going back to something like 1896. Um, and these days we're, we consist of four um, affiliates, Unite, the GMB, Prospect and Community. Uh, but we really cover members in manufacturing, engineering, aerospace, shipbuilding, defence, uh, and across that sort of uh, heavy industry footprint. And the CSEU is also uh, the body that led um, the last big campaign we had on working time, the Drive for 35 in 1989-90. Um, and that campaign actually was part of an international effort uh, to really crack uh, the nut of, of working time, which at that point was stuck at 39 hours a week uh, in manufacturing. And the, the CSEU and the affiliated unions worked with IG Metal in Germany, uh, and many other unions across Europe in a coordinated campaign, um, which actually involved a long period of preparation uh, to build the case for trade union reps, for, for their members, uh, to uh, start the dialogue with employers and to gear up uh, for a campaign. And the tactic that was used at that time was to identify 12 key employers in the manufacturing sector and actually target them with strategic industrial action to try and shift the dial on working time. And everybody else in manufacturing uh, was called on to pay a levy of an hour's pay each week uh, into a central strike fund. And that money was used to pay 80% of the wages of those workers that were going on strike. Uh, and it was actually really, really successful. I mean, some of the factories actually were out for months. Um, it turned out to be quite a brutal uh, campaign, which went on for some time. We had situations where sister plants and uh, plants that relied on other plants for work that were on strike but those workers were locked out uh, and, and weren't paid anything. Uh, but I think it's, a, it's an absolute measure of the determination that was built up amongst union members that they carried on those strikes, even when the strike fund ran out of money uh, and the unions were scrabbling to try and raise funds to pay the wages. And tonight's actually a momentous occasion because it's actually 31 years to the day uh, that the first employer conceded in that dispute. It was NEI Parsons on the 9th of November, 1989, uh, that conceded uh, the shorter working week. Um, and it, the, a former president of the CSU, Ian Tonks, re recounts that he was watching it on teletext, which was the only way you could get news at the time. And top of the story was uh, NEI Parsons conceded shorter working week. Um, and he was cock a hoop. And so this is gonna be national news until about five minutes later, the headline changed and it said, Berlin Wall falls. So you might have spotted that the 9th of November 1989 is also uh, the date that the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, so we were, we were kind of, um, our fox was shot, as uh, a friend of mine used to say. But it was an important point in the dispute because once NEI Parsons conceded, other employers quickly followed. And we shifted the dial from 39 hours a week to 37 hours uh, being the norm in manufacturing. And, and many people who were taking part and, and listening tonight will know that that then rolled out across the rest of the economy and 37 hours a week uh, became the norm right across the UK economy for, for some time afterwards. Since then, 
the CSEU campaign um, has been on hold. Um, and I've, I've got to say, as a, as a full-time officer, and Tony referenced my time at Unite, I would deal with national negotiations and in every year in every company at every plant, top of the list of demands would be a shorter working week. Um, and every year in every plant, in every company, it'd be the first thing that got tossed aside by both the employer and the trade union side who said, oh, it's not the moment, you know, it's not going to happen. Um, and last year, the CSEU, um, under Tony's presidency, uh, we, we were considering re reawakening uh, the campaign for, for shorter working time. And we, we actually commissioned the New Economics Foundation to carry out um, some research for us. And uh, uh, they produced the report, uh, Making Up for Lost Time, which you can see in the links, I think, for this meeting. Um, and that was really an attempt to look at how shorter working time was, was won in plants um, and economies across the world. And I think the key takeaway from that was that um, union-led campaigns have the best chance of winning lasting success uh, in moving the dial on, on working time. Um, and so we were gearing up uh, for a campaign. Um, and then along came the general election and, and we were fascinated, I have to say, uh, to see this issue of a four day week um, suddenly uh, become part of the Labour Party commitment. John McDonnell was talking about it. It became uh, part of the, uh, the the kind of offering that Labour was putting forward. Um, and I have to say, I also saw how um, how widely that was attacked. And I agree with everything that Anna said, except I think, and, and I'd make this point quite strongly, I think the vehicle of a four day week, um, and that as a slogan, um, is not helpful. Um, and I think it's because our economy is really fractured. You know, at one end, uh, I've got members who are working a 35 hour week. They're doing that in four days already. We've even got some plants that are doing uh, their hours in three days. Um, they do three times 12 hours and do a 36 hour week. There's nothing in it for them. Uh, and I've got conveners who would say to me, I can't sell a four day week. We're already doing that. Um, at the other end, you've got the what I call the years and years scenario. Any of you that saw that TV program? Uh, where people are working three or four jobs in, in our gig economy, working 50, 60 hours a week just to survive and keep their heads up of water and pay the rent. Um, and if you listen to any of these uh, phone-ins on, on LBC or Five Live or whatever, when, when this issue is raised, you get these people ringing in, in their droves saying, you will cut my throat. You'll, you, I won't be able to survive if you take away my ability to work these hours. And there's nothing in it um, for them either. So I think our view last year was that... Um, Working time clearly was on the agenda, but we had a mountain to climb in terms of convincing people and finding the right vehicle for the argument. And then along came COVID um, and turned the world on its head. Um, and we had the spectacle of a Tory government um, embracing social partners, calling in the TUC and CBI as equal partners uh, into 10 and 11 Downing Street, uh, creating a furlough scheme based on the German insurance scheme that actually um, I took a group of shop stewards to Germany some years ago, Tony will remember this. One of the key recommendations was the, um, the, the scheme that Germans have um, for, for insurance against short time working. We, we proposed years ago that the UK should look at that and it, it clearly was uh, ahead of its time. Um, we saw a situation where employers responded with huge amounts uh, of home working, uh, alternating and more flexible shift patterns, social distancing being built into production areas, and example after example of people working more flexibly and somehow being more efficient than they were when they were working their fixed hours. In the midst of all of that, the Alex Ferry Foundation, which is the charity that we set up using the proceeds that were left over uh, from the 35 hour week campaign, we commissioned IPPR to carry out some research into what was actually happening during the COVID, um, at the height of the COVID crisis. And uh, again, we've got a link to that report, the COVID shift. Um, and what that showed is that there was a growing desire uh, amongst manufacturing workers uh, for shorter working time. It demonstrated that where unions have been involved, change worked more efficiently um, and the changes were implemented more smoothly uh, and have been longer lasting. One of the key recommendations, by the way, that they've made, uh, which I think is helpful to flag up, is for a, a new bank holiday next year, given that 2021 will be the 150th anniversary of the first ever bank holiday. Uh, in the UK and that bank holiday would celebrate uh, NHS and key workers in the way that we we did all that clapping um, at eight o'clock on a Thursday evening um, and I suppose you know the question for me is 
where now? Where do we go now, having had, had the world uh, turned upside down and, and, and um, seeing the way in which things have changed? And I think um, what's clear is that um, COVID presents an enormous opportunity in that I think people are saying, uh, what will the new normal look like? Having experienced this shift in flexibility, the ability to work the hours to fit around your family, uh, to not have to commute every day on a packed tube or a bus or sit in queues of traffic. I think I think there's a real appetite for people um, to find a way of unlocking that. And I think that the, the, the biggest tragedy of all would be if we slowly let things drift back to the way that they were. Um, so I think the first thing I would say is, the first key point is we have to seize the opportunity that this crisis uh, has brought about and the shift uh, in thinking that, that's been engendered in people. The second issue I think is, and, and Anna covered this, is we really have to think about working time in its broadest sense. And for me, it's actually not about working time. It's, it's about work-life balance. Um, I don't know any people, including the ones, by the way, who work in a three-day week, who would say that the balance in their lives between when they're at work and when they're at home is right. Um, certainly for those people that are working 60 hours a week doing three or four jobs, they would say that the balance in their lives between work and their home lives isn't, isn't right. So I think that, that this whole issue of work-life balance is something which appeals to people at each end of the spectrum and, and hopefully by definition to everybody uh, between those endpoints. And I think, by the way, we should also include the right to switch off. Uh, I, I don't know how many people uh, now, where you're, you're so used to looking at your smartphone um, picking up your emails, your texts, that th this goes on late into the evenings, it goes into weekends. Other countries are looking at the right to disconnect. And I think that should be built in as well. And I think the third and final thing for me is that unions are key. Um, and I referenced this, but I think um, for me, rather than a top down uh, government or institution led reduction in working time, which for instance was implemented in France to varying degrees of success, we need unions to be liberated. Uh, to be legitimized uh, and to be celebrated. Um, and you know, the history of the CSU tells us that where unions build campaigns, leading their workers uh, in strategic action, are delivering a strong negotiate position, that's what delivers lasting change. So I'm gonna hand over to Andy in a minute. And I hope that Andy, um, as a, a Labour uh, front bench spokesman is gonna tell us that we've moved on from the four day week campaign to something else in terms of rebalancing our lives. But most of all, I hope that Andy's going to tell us that Labour will commit to repealing some of these completely repressive anti-union laws that have held the country and the trade union movement back for the last four decades. I think if COVID's shown anything, it's that unions are a force for good. Um, and all I would say is let us do our jobs. Uh, let us do our jobs in general, but let us do our jobs on working time. Working with our members, we can unleash uh, a whole army of people who are ready for change. You just needed to give us the tools to be able to do our job. Thank you. Th thanks Thanks very much, Ian. That was a, a really good overview of where the CSEU actually is on this question of shorter working time. And I just before I bring Andy in, I just want to say a couple of words there. There's a bit of reference by yourself and by Anna to the situation in Germany, which is something that we've been very fascinated by, and in fact, we've had numerous meetings with um, IG Metal about that uh, famous 28-hour uh, working week uh, deal. And, you know, people do send us think, why have they got it? Well, it's not a deal that applies to everybody. You've got to ask for it, but it's there in the national collective agreement. But how did they do it? They spent a full year preparing the ground with their own members. And they explained why it was important, but let the members themselves decide on taking it forward. And the 28 hour week is a, is a, it's a two year window and it's work life balance. It's there for when you've got young children and you need time off and also to look after aged parents and also for community work. And I think that that was a good start. And I think you'll see from the COVID crisis in Germany that will stand the IG Metal um, in good stead for its two and a half million members working in engineering and electrical. So I think that um, 
the idea of, of working with the shop stewards and the union reps is the right way to go about this. And I think, um, you know, we need the political clout from our friends in the Labour Party when we do get back into power uh, to be able to push this uh, and make sure that we've got the wherewithal to, int to uh, introduce it. So I'm going to bring in our good friend and comrade now, uh, Andy, Andy MacDonald. Andy, as many of you know, is MP for Middlesbrough, but very importantly for us, he's the Shadow Secretary of State for Employment Rights. And um, we've already been the CSEU because of the campaign for shorter time. It's an issue that uh, we've already talked to Andy about. Now, all being well, if the vaccine that uh, Johnson has announced mm. this evening uh, is going to be available uh, by Christmas, it's amazing everything should be available by Christmas, but into next year, perhaps we can get out as a CSEU with the support of the uh, NEF and, uh, and our parliamentary colleagues to get campaigning on the whole issue of uh, shorter working time, as we were intended to do in the initial instance. So, Andy, we'd uh, very much look forward to hearing what you've got to say. And maybe you can reassure Ian that you're going to repeal these anti-union laws and uh, work towards a short, uh, give us the wherewithal to get a shorter working uh, time. Thanks, mate. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tony. It's really good to be with you. And it's uh, great to follow Ian and, and hear from Anna. I think I know what I want for my Christmas is Anna's book. Uh, I think that's going to be on the list and you're right we see everything through the prism of uh, covid and we've got that exciting news today uh wasn't particularly um uh enamored with the uh, narrative from the prime minister about the bugle call of a cavalry i'm not so sure we need to express it in those terms but we're all cautious rightly so but there is genuine optimism about this and this is really really good news uh and hopefully uh, others, in addition to Pfizer, will come forward with their own breakthroughs. Um, so I, I very much welcome this timely discussion, uh, Tony. That we will emerge from this pandemic at some stage. We're all hoping beyond hope it's sooner rather than later. And it's said that when we do, we'll, we'll, we'll build back better. And I agree with that. Uh, and whilst we want to get back to some semblance of normality, uh, it can't be business as usual, can't be back to business as usual. Again, I agree with that. But what does building back better uh, look like? And I say we need a deal for working people, a new deal for working people. And what's happened across the Atlantic has got to give us hope. And, and whilst none of us know if uh, Joe Biden uh, can be an FDR, I do live in hope, and I'm confident that the world has turned a page with his election. The US rejoining the World Health Organization and rejoining the Paris Climate Accord will be a really good start. But President-elect Biden gave us an indication of what he thought uh, was important in the world of work some years ago. And in his memo to his staff in 2014, just before Thanksgiving, that's resurfaced in recent days, he urged them to make sure that they don't miss anything important to do with their family. And it's strange that that comes to the fore uh, today again. And, and, and I've just had a meeting with the Sue Ryder charity about bereavement leave. Uh, I think we're really poor in this country about ensuring that people, workers, have the space to grieve. And there's a lot of grieving going on across the country and across the world right now with COVID-19. And the space to grieve certainly isn't well reflected in many terms and conditions in the workplace, and it's about time it was. Uh, we need more than sympathetic employers and workers being signed off from work, important as both those things are. And relevant to that in my discussion with Ian and Tony some weeks ago, I raised the issue of the monetization of the deficits in working cultures, and, and both Anna and Ian have alluded to this, you know, what does the long hours culture do to us in terms of mental health and strain on families and relationships and the financial consequences that flow from that? All of these things have consequences. Not having enough time away from work costs people and their families dear. 
It costs society dear, and we should reflect on how we structure and arrange our working time. And with the availability of time, as Anna's alluded to, working people could themselves use that time to engage in other sectors of the economy, the arts, sports, cultural activities, and so on. All of that has an economic value. So the reallocation of working time and wealth are, in my view, central to the question of what kind of a society we want to create. So it's been fascinating to hear more about how the CSEU has succeeded in negotiating shorter working hours and how this has led to many similar agreements being achieved. And uh, it's been many decades since the CSEU embarked on this endeavour. And it's timely for us to be discussing how we can learn and build on such brilliant work. And it is important to state that there is uh, a much in common here, but it isn't the same as the four day week, as you, as you said, uh, Tony. Uh, and that's been prominent in discussions uh, in the Labour and Trade Union movement for the past uh, uh, few years. And in terms of the four day week campaign during the 2019 election, Labour's pledged to reduce average full-time work, weekly working hours to 32 across the economy with no loss of pay, funded by productivity increases within a decade, was sadly distorted, misrepresented and devalued much of the discussion. And the pledge was used as a, a form of an, an effective attack on the deliverability of our programme. So there wasn't really a proper discussion about the issues at stake. And I, I see this evening as a necessary engagement and part of uh, taking that forward. And perhaps the, the policy failed to connect with workers uh, that we sought to represent. And Tony, you've explained why that might be. And yes, voters can sometimes be sceptical of grand promises from political parties, especially when what is promised appears to be unachievable. So perhaps we didn't explain the policy well enough. So we should reflect. An advantage of the sort of approach uh, set out by my fellow speakers tonight is, is that it's far more tangible because it starts with practical gains made in workplaces by trade unions. These gains are credible and they are achievable. But Ian, we're four years away from the next general election and the next clause five meeting the Labour Party uh, when detail on manifesto pledges are decided are still a long way off. But it does mean that the Labour and Trade Union, Union movement has significant time uh, and space to re-engage with the issues of productivity and the time people should spend at work and elsewhere. It's up to us in the movement to spell out what it would mean to build an economy and a society which would bring about productivity increases that we haven't seen under the Tories over the last decade, but would also ensure that the fruits of a successful economy could be enjoyed by the working people whose labour it is dependent upon. And I recognise that the time between now and the next general election also means that workers cannot just wait for the next Labour government to see improvements in their working conditions. This is what makes these campaigns so vital over the next few years. Of course, that's not to say that government policy doesn't play a critical role. The extent to which such agreements can be made is restricted by low, lower trade union membership than we would want. And of course, the very thing that Ian referred to, the restrictive anti-trade union legislation. And without changes to legislation, it will be difficult for these type of agreements, whether trade unions negotiate shorter working hours to happen outside of a number of already well unionized sectors. So in fact, across much of the economy, many workers face the opposite problem. And we've got an illustration of that with the government's failure to protect workers from the immoral practice of fire and rehire, employee, employees being dismissed before being rehired on inferior terms and conditions. And that's gonna to lead to their rights and protections being slashed, as we've already seen with amongst others, uh, British gas staff, who are now being pressurized into signing up to contracts that will see their working week extended, along with other regressive measures. And at a time of high unemployment, 
employees will be forced to accept reduced terms and conditions through fire and rehire. And it's, it's good that the furlough scheme's been extended, but I fear without further targeted uh, sectoral support in the months ahead, it's likely many more companies will fire and rehire their staff unless action is taken to protect the economy and workers' rights, there will be a race to the bottom. And these are all political decisions on the part of the Conservative government. They're not economic necessities. It isn't a necessity to take a laissez-faire approach to entire sectors of the economy. It isn't a necessity to see thousands of good jobs vanish. And it's not a necessity that working people should have to pay for the impact of COVID-19 with cuts to their income and less favourable terms and conditions, including extensions to their working hours. And unfortunately, because of the weakening of trade union workplace rights over the past decade, for many people, the working week is, is longer in practice than it is on paper. Employees today are often working excess of their contracted hours with no additional or appropriate remuneration, as we've seen with the exploitation of sports direct staff in the company's uh, Shirebrook uh, warehouse. They were, weren't able to leave the building during their 30 minute unpaid breaks. So to begin with, there is an urgent need to strengthen employment rights that would prevent the exploitation of workers who are already working in excess of their contracted hours and to encourage the more of the sort of campaign being carried out by the CSEU. And as Keir himself pledged under his leadership, the Labour Party will continue to work shoulder to shoulder with trade unions to stand up for working people, tackle insecure work and low pay, repeal the Trade Union Act, oppose Tory attacks on the right to take industrial action and the weakening of workplace rights. So by strengthening trade union representation, workers' voices will be heard in decisions that directly impact how businesses are run and more widely, how we structure the economy to work for working people. And I'm delighted that Kia has sustained the commitment of re-establishing a department for employment, which would give the 30 million working people across the country a dedicated voice at the cabinet table. And I'm incredibly honored to have been given the responsibility as the Labour Party Shadow Secretary of State for Employment Rights and Protections to speak up for workers at a time when a revaluation of work and the workplace rights could hardly be more pertinent. And by ending disguised self-employment and bringing in single status employment for all workers, apart from the genuinely self-employed, they could thereby enjoy full protections from the start of their employment. A Department for Employment could also allow the government proper oversight of collective sectoral bargaining which would be essential for bringing about good quality, well-paid jobs, being shared evenly, facilitated by raised wages and opportunities to reduce hours. That would go somewhere to, to solving the problem I spoke of earlier regarding low trade union membership, preventing a barrier for many workers in agreeing to shortening the working week. It would be those at the lower end of the income scale who would benefit most from shortened working uh, week, as Anna uh, said earlier, and other improvements that could be won through the reinstatement of sectoral collective bargaining across all the sectors of the UK economy. So, Tony, concluding as I started, I very much welcome the opportunity of engaging with you on these issues. The Labour and Trade Union movement's founding purpose was to secure better terms and conditions for working people to include securing a reduction on long working hours to enable people to lead happy, content and fulfilled lives. And this discussion tonight is another step along the road. And I'm extraordinarily grateful to you all for giving me the opportunity to join with you on it today. Thanks very much, Tony. That was very, very interesting. And we're very pleased to hear those commitments are being given. We've got um, a number of questions that have come in. We've had some that were sent in earlier as well. 
And I'm going to start with a question from His Lordship John Hendy, who has joined us. And I just need to go on to the, the post on the chat. And John is saying that the Institute of Employment Rights advocated the reduction of the working week, not by seeking a four-day week, but by increasing guaranteed breaks required in the working time regulations. Breaks during shifts and between shifts, extending weekend breaks and lengthening paid holidays, all without any reduction of uh, income. And John wants to know, has the panel got any thoughts on that? And I'll start with, with Anna. Okay, well, um, yes, I, I want to stress again what I tried to say when I was talking earlier, that although we've used the phrase, the case for a four-day week, it's about, it's about headlining a much more nuanced uh, set of ideas. And we're not saying that a four-day week, the case for a four-day week is the case for a uniform four-day week for everyone. There's many better ways of doing it. And what the idea is to support innovation, as I said, and build up the experience of shorter working hours in a number of different ways. So as John suggests, um, I'm sure that there will be in many workplaces, increased breaks will be what people really crave. Other people will want longer weekends. Some people will want um, term time shifts, for example. And all our in research into what happened in France when they instituted suddenly from the top down mm. a 35 hour week shows us that people value having control over their time, being able to anticipate uh, when they can get time off and when they can't. And so I think, um, I, I mean, I, I agree with John up to a point, but I think there will be lots of people also who'd want a four day week who would really benefit from a three day weekend. And I don't think we should be afraid of using that phrase as a way of suggesting that four days a week or 30 hours, which is could be its equivalent, spread over whatever period of time, depending on who's who it's for. That, that, but we need something that brings it all together. We can't be talking, if it's gonna have a campaign, you need a simple message. I'm sorry, that's just the case. And so, um, so yes, I, I I agree. What we need is flexibility, and, um, and 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 giving as much control as possible to working people over their time. Ian, yeah, I'd agree. I mean, I think um, there are lots of tools in the toolbox, um, and you know, um, paid breaks, uh, longer holidays, you know, enforcing the working time regulations properly. Uh, could be one one of the tools in the toolbox. I mean, ironically, actually in manufacturing, a lot of our reps have kind of bargained away yeah. breaks and the breaks have been swallowed up to, to give an earlier finish time uh, to the day. Um, so it's gone in the opposite direction in a way. I, but I think, you know, what the question flags up is what I, what I was saying, what Anna's just highlighted is that um, I think the four-day week is a clumsy slogan. That's my problem with it. If we could put that to one side, we are all agreeing that um, the fundamental thing um, that's most important to me is the balance between work and home. And rebalancing that is about people having control of their lives um, yes. and the hours that they work and the way in which they work them, when they work them and when they don't work. That's the critical thing. Yes. So I think it's really about all of these things that, that we're throwing on the table being part of a huge menu of options that, that trade unions can then pick and choose according to the, 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 the needs, the wishes and the desires of their members. And that builds the groundswell of support that then leads to a successful campaign. And Lee? Yeah, thanks, Tony. I think that's the key. It's about control uh, of your own working um, destiny, as it were. Uh, I mean, the imbalance is stark and it's shifted so massively over the last several decades that I think it's one of the, it almost creeps up by by stealth and but it, it's out of kilter and it has been for a very long time and hence the need uh, to repeal the legislation that I referred to and enhance uh, uh, trade unions uh, roles in, in, in the workplace um, but uh, colleagues are absolutely right there's a whole raft of, uh, of possibilities there's a whole toolbox to address this issue but in terms of increasing breaks, I think we've just got to remind ourselves of the sort of environment that a lot of workers endure. Uh, I, I made reference in my remarks about Sports Direct and about how those breaks are operated. We also have care workers going between homes, trying to 
uh, carry out their duties under incredible pre t pressure, t pressure of time and then not, not being paid, it's not a break, it's the gap between them getting from, to, from one domiciliary visit to another. And where that sort of environment obtains, it is just a recipe for uh, ever greater exploitation. So we've got to actually get to, the, get to grips with some of the specifics in certain sectors where these things are not concerned. <laughs> but colleagues are absolutely right. There's a, there's a whole series of tools that are available to us and we should utilise them all. Thanks, Andy. And the next question has come from, uh, from Laura, who says, um, more jobs are being replaced by technology. Might we see more people being sustained by payments from the government, such as universal credit? And I'll kick off with Ian. Yes, I saw this pop up in the chat and I thought oh, this is a really, really fascinating um, element to it. Um, and it, it almost seems like a, a lifetime ago that we were talking about Industry 4.0 um, mm. and the impact of automation and uh, artificial intelligence uh, and everything else. And there's no doubt that that's going to have um, a huge impact. Uh, but if you look at the NEF report that I referenced earlier, um, actually, it shows that um, in the UK we have something like 28 robots per 100,000 100 workers uh, and in, in the I've got the figures wrong 100,000 workers and in Germany it's 380 odd um, so they have a much higher level of automation but they also have a much higher level of employment uh, they have a much higher level uh, of efficiency and productivity and so it's not necessarily the case that um, this idea that the automation and, and robotizing things will necessarily lead to a loss of jobs. It may be that people are doing different jobs uh, in the future. In terms of universal credit, universal uh, basic income, I mean, that's a big political uh, debate, which isn't really for me. I, my world is about uh, helping union members find their own solutions, protecting employment, arguing about reskilling, retraining. You know, the majority of tomorrow's workforce is already working today. We just need to unlock the skills and abilities they've got and transfer them into the jobs that are going to be required in the future. Andy? I think this is really fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in Ian's point that uh, it doesn't, uh, technology doesn't necessarily lead to the expected loss of jobs, but yeah, the, the creation of different jobs is, is, is something that we've, we've spoken about before. And if you're creating time for people to enjoy, that does produce expansion in other parts of the economy. Surely as night follows day, there were then things that could, people can attend to uh, and engage in uh, that would, they would otherwise not be able to do. So I think it's circular really, um, but it's a, it's a fascinating area. In terms of um, the vexed issue of universal basic income, um, it, it, clearly that's a, a hot, political issue and we're going to have to uh, examine that in very great detail over the over these coming years i'm not in a position to commit to that as you as you can fully expect that that just isn't possible but i do look and you referred to germany tony on many occasions and how they responded to the financial crisis uh, and, mm. and and established mechanisms to enable them to uh, perhaps better cope with uh, uh, emergencies such as this. And I will be fascinating, uh, fascinated to study how Germany has responded to this and how their, uh, their, their mechanisms and structures have enabled them to cope with the, re re the distribution of funding to working people when they've been uh, bedeviled by this crisis. And I think it's something that I would like to study, I would like to uh, learn more about, and I'm sure many colleagues would as well. And Anna? Yes, well, uh, my answer to the question of what do we do about automation is partly I agree that we're not going to lose all jobs through automation, but also that there is a, another route other than just thinking about um, giving people uh, cash benefits, because you have to think about income as having two sides to it. You've got the cash income and you've got the sort of in-kind benefits, which are our public services, which are by and large... Um, labor intensive and cannot be automated out of existence. So what we need to be doing is thinking about expanding uh, um, and improving the public services that we already have and 
reaching out into new areas like um, housing and transport and uh, social care and child care to really provide a decent uh, social income for everyone uh, or a social wage as it used to be called which is labor intensive which gives more people um, an income and more control and it improves everybody's lives and I think that that's what we call universal basic services and um, and there's a whole well we've done a, a, a book about that which is published this year and it's a good response to the idea of well you know what's the answer we just give everybody cash handouts yes people need decent income support and we we've proposed at new economics foundation a guaranteed minimum income but not um at the expense of expanding public services which are the 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 sort of virtual of the social income that we all need and that's the way to get more jobs and give people more <laughs> control and better pay so that's where i would um i would go with that one thanks anna we've got a uh, i'm going to take another couple of questions and go around again well, we got a comment, Kate, come in from um, uh, Stewie Davis uh, of uh, Bentley Motors in Crewe, who says that um, as a benefactor of a shorter working week at Bentley Motors, uh, subsequent moves to return to a four-day week, still 35 hours, were not popular. Five shorter days were more important than longer, but less days. And that's a comment from one of our senior Unite Shop stewards in, in the automotive industry. Um, I've got a, a question come in from Roger Jiri, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll pose this one uh, and starting off with Andy. To what extent would this campaign be aided by the introduction of sectoral bargaining, creating a set of principles which individual organisations and companies could use as a basis for negotiation? Over to you, Andy, and then uh, I'll go to Anna and then Ian. Well, Tony, I've been in post since April of this year and before that four years with the transport brief, dealing uh, uh, with uh, employment issues there as well, engaging with ASLEF, RMT and TSSA and Unite and, and others. Um, and it occurs to me that every time we go around these issues, we keep coming back to the uh, principle of sectoral collective bargaining. And it, it, I mean, I've had many discussion with my good friend, John Hendy on this, and it does seem uh, that giving um, uh, workers and their trade unions the ability to negotiate, we've just heard that from Bentley Motors now, um, uh, if they have that capacity and ability to negotiate those terms and those bargaining those bargains are legally enforceable that to me presents the, 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 a, a very sensible and attractive way forward so I think the, the, the question is a, is a very acute one an insightful one and I think with, 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 with the, without sectoral collective bargaining there's not a great deal we're going to be able to achieve so I'm wholly supportive of the principle, as you would expect. Anna? Yes, I don't think this is really one for me. I, I think um, trade union bargaining, sectoral bargaining too, would be a, an important part of the picture. I wouldn't like to suggest that it's going to solve it for everyone because there are some people who are not in trade unions. There are people who you know, should be but aren't. And so we need a combination of... Of, of, of regulations to underpin the successes, uh, the, the, the achievements that trade union bargaining can do. And while I'm here, can I just say one thing about work-life balance, which was came up as a big thing earlier. And I, I, I worry about that phrase because it's really, really important that shorter working hours are not just something for women with children um, so they can spend more time at home. Because that is actually one of the most, uh, the strongest reasons why we can't deal with gender inequalities, while there's still a huge big pay gap and so on. Um, I've written about this elsewhere, but I think it's really important that, uh, that if we're going to talk about a work-life balance, we've got to perhaps think of another way of describing it because it really does, it's been used as a way of saying, oh, well, women need more time off to spend at home with their kids. And it's got to be for men as well. And it's really important that men have shorter hours as, on the same basis as women. Anyway, that's another point. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. And Ian? 
Yes, well, I take that point, Anna. I think that's uh, very valid criticism. So having having said I disagree with the four day week, I uh, <laughs> I take that that pushback. We need to find the right phrase for this, um, and I absolutely understand that. I mean, there must be something which is gender neutral. I do think the issue of, of, of imbalance in in our lives affects men just as as much as it affects women. Um, so yes, point taken on that. Um, just in terms of collective uh, bargaining. Um, it would be easy for me to say yes, um, yes, you know, that's the vehicle. But I think it's a yes, but, um, you know, there are some areas of the economy where we've already got very strong bargaining. We've got strong bargaining at plant level or at company level. Um, and those reps are fiercely proud of what they do and I think would resent um, any move to somehow incorporate them into some bigger uh, body when, when they believe they're doing a good job themselves. We've got other areas of the economy where people are absolutely unrepresented where unions face an absolutely massive struggle to organize and to represent people and I made one half halfway house I, mean, I mentioned this to Andy the other week when we were on a call was I used to sit on the agricultural wages board which was the last of the wages councils uh, which the Tories uh, unfortunately abolished but that spoke on behalf of 150,000 agricultural workers in this country that are very very difficult to organize working in ones and twos uh, in all sorts of remote locations and it was a way in which there was an underpinning floor of pay terms and conditions that gave them um, a floor of rights uh, that, that's now been stripped away. And, and I wonder whether there's something in all that. I think in terms of collective bargaining and manufacturing, you know, at the time of the 35 hour week campaign, there was a huge, strong employers engineering federation that represented the employees on the other side of the table. That's been stripped away. It's had to remake itself as, as Mate UK doesn't exist in the same form, doesn't have the same collective bargaining responsibilities. So um, it, whilst it appears to be a very easy and straightforward solution um, on the face of it, I, I think there are, there are some difficulties around it. So I'd give it a, a cautious uh, welcome. That's the best way I can put it. Th th thanks, thanks, Ian. I've got two, two more questions that probably will take us through to uh, closing time for this uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, the first one is from Bora uh, Octas. Bora asks, a four-day week sounds great. However, for those who are on low income, this will only lead uh, to working two or three jobs. Is a four-day week only viable for those on relatively decent wages? Thank you. And uh, we'll kick off with, uh, with uh, Anna. Well, I, I hoped I'd made it clear, actually, that um, you can't have a campaign for shorter working hours without a campaign against low pay. And we set out a number of uh, measures we think will help to, um, to combat low pay, you know, raising the living wage, um, doing things about the pay ratio within companies and, and and obviously increasing the strength of trade unions to bargain for better pay. So I don't think um, it's true that it will always mean, or it must always mean that, that working people on low wages will have to just do more jobs. If it does that, then it's not worth doing. It has to be done with um, campaigns against low pay. So and, and that must be a priority. Thanks, Anna. Ian? Well, I, I agree with everything that Andy just said. I mean, I think um, in, in situations where unions are well organised, where they're strong, where there's a strong collective bargaining um, agenda and, and mechanism, then you, you're always going to see advances. And in, effectively, the argument I've put forward is that engineering and manufacturing can be the cutting edge for the rest of the economy. If we win concessions on working time in engineering and manufacturing, then history tells us they'll roll out on a broader basis and we set the baseline. Uh, for the rest of the economy but but absolutely as a as a as a trade unionist a socialist you cannot um um accept that privileged position without thinking about everybody else in the economy and and people at the other end of the spectrum that i talked about who are having and andy referenced some of this you know those care workers my nephew um riding his push bike from one care appointment to another care appointment you know in the pouring down rain stressed out because he was behind schedule you know um and having to do that and having to do it hour after hour after hour, day after day, just to pay the rent and, and to pay the bills, you know, and there's got to be an answer in all of this for people who are in that situation. 
Um, and slogans, whatever the slogan is, that just that doesn't do it. It's got to be a much broader campaign centered around trade union bargaining where we can do that, but with a broader political agenda to lift the floor for everybody uh, so that we don't have a scenario where people have to work 60 hours a week in those sorts of conditions just to pay the bills. It's absolutely immoral. Thanks, uh, Ian and Andy. Yeah, I think this whole discussion about uh, the, the working uh, week is a part of the, uh, of the, the wider concerns around the world of work. Um, and it would be a complete and utter failure if we ended up in a position where having uh, achieved a reduced working week, that people just had to take on more jobs to make ends meet. This is about a wider malaise, and, it, you know, and, it, and it's exemplified by uh, the proliferation in zero hours contracts. The rise that we've seen in that in, in the, the last decade is absolutely phenomenal, and the lack of protections that people have. So looking at the, 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 the length of the working week, however you want to describe it, whatever uh, um, uh, label you want to attach to it, is merely part of the better deal that's needed for working people. Uh, and that is about better protections and better recognition, the things we've talked about tonight. But I would agree with the, with the inquirer that this would be absolutely reprehensible if we ended up in a position where people had to do more jobs. And that's why it, this can only form part of the solution. And th thanks very much, Andy. And a final question, because I've just been notified we're running over, <laughs> is to my colleague Diana Holland. And, and Diana from Unite says, how can this campaign also support demands from workers for different working time patterns at different times in their lives? And she also thanks everybody because she says it's been a very interesting discussion. And we're kicking off with, uh, with, uh, with um, Anna. Well, uh, this is precisely what we said. It has to be about it has to be about flexibility, and it has to be about, I think, uh, establishing a general set of principles about what the maximum and the minimum number of hours ought to be, and then enabling as much flexibility as possible for individuals to so that they can get the hours that suit them. I don't think every is going to be perfect, but this is what we should be aiming for. So it should be part and parcel of the campaign, really. That's the um, that's that's the objective, and that's what we've set out in the book. And and we we can learn from other people's experience in other countries as well. Thank, thanks, thanks, Anna. Ian. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think this is the nub of the IG Metal Agreement that, that was referenced earlier on. It, it really is about empowering people to make different choices at different points in their lives. And, you know, you, you look mm. at the, the typical journey that we all go on. Um, I will never forget my first boss at Stockport Council saying to me, life's upside down. So you never have money when you need it. When you first get in a relationship, you get a mortgage, you get a house, you have kids. That's when you're at the bottom of the pay scales, but you need the most money. He said, look at me, approaching retirement, paid off my mortgage, my kids are left home. I've got more money than I need. Life's upside down. And, and it's the same in terms of working time. You know, you go through the whole thing of having kids. You're desperate to be able to get uh, to do the school run, to have school holidays uh, and all that, to deal with illnesses that arise. Um, you get into middle age. There might be a period where you want self-improvement to do your evening classes, to learn a language, do whatever. And then you move into the period later on where, you're, where your elderly parents start to get ill and you need time off to look after them and to deal with unexpected emergencies. There's just different pressures that, uh, that emerge through our life cycles where a working pattern that suits you when you're 25 might not suit you when, you, when you're 55 or 65. Uh, and I think Diana's absolutely right. And, and it goes back to this whole issue about having control of your life and not having your life dictated by your work, but you fit in working around your life. That's that's what we're talking about here. So I think that's absolutely the nub of this whole argument. And if we can capture that in a slogan, that'd be brilliant. Thanks, thanks, Ian. And finally, Andy. Now, I think we're in horrible agreement here. <laughs> and I, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm not so sure it's about trying to capture it in the slogan. I would perhaps differentiate on that. It's getting it right in the detail. And that flexibility just simply has to be there. And this has been a fascinating discussion because it's, it's teased out those issues, that there are changes in our lives that uh, we have to navigate uh, through and, and around. And the, the flexibility in the working arrangements 
currently aren't there for uh, millions and millions of people. And we've got to be smart as to how we uh, respond to that. But Dan has uh, really gone to the, the heart of it with a, a question. And, and that is going to demand an awful lot of detail, an awful lot of thought. Uh, but we've got to be up to that challenge. And um, I think it's a fascinating one. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Andy. Uh, well, comrades, that'll bring us to the end of the questions. I've got a comment coming in from Phil Rudd, who's a Unite uh, a convener in the aerospace industry, said he had problems joining, but makes the point that upskilling has got to be part of the campaign as well. And mm -hmm. I'm sure as we go through this, Phil, and we have mm -hmm. either more of these meetings or meetings of the uh, uh, CSEU executive and colleagues from the uh, 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 Economics Foundation and also from from the IER. This is going to be another part that will we'll fit in. So, comrades, thanks very much for coming along and taking part in this evening. To Andy, Ian and Anna, absolutely brilliant. Answered yeah, the questions you. brilliantly. You'll have seen a number of uh, recommended um, uh, documents there on this issue that are on the chat line. Um, Andy's already said that he wants to get Anna's book as part of uh, his Christmas uh, presents, and uh, I think that that would go for us all. And I have to say that um, this has been a great discussion from the CSEU's point of view, because this has got to be a, a, a central part of the, the plan for the next uh, few years. And we'll be discussing this again in our executive committee and with our affiliated unions and in the TUC and in the Labour Party. So this is always going to be at the forefront. I've just got to make a couple of announcements before we sign off. Um, if you like the Zoom meeting, then sign up for the IER newsletter um, at their website where you can get the latest employment rights, information straight to your inbox, including advance notice of these meetings. We've also got the Campaign for Trade Union Freedom website, uh, currently not producing a printed newsletter, but regular tweets and updates and uh, employment rights issues from around the world and how to affiliate. Uh, also to say that um, the IER reading links are going to be on a slide at the end of this. There's another IER event on access for justice, and I should have kept the details and I haven't, but no doubt CAD will post them out again. And the next paid IER event is the employment uh, law update. And again, that's on the uh, details at the end of the slide. So thanks to our panel members. Thanks for CAD and uh, James, who worked all the background controls done a fantastic job and um, if you need any foot more information on this issue then go on to the CSEU website and you can download the documents there and you'll see regular updates from the CSEU which is being rejuvenated now uh, and going to do the job that uh, we've always wanted it to do so thanks very much and um, thanks for attending thanks, and Tony. hope you've enjoyed it thank you thanks, Cheers. bye bye Bye. 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 Bye.